In the Kuban region of the USSR, on the shore of the Azov Sea, 40 kilometers from the city of Yeisk, there is a small fishing village located around a group of grain elevators. It is called Paraprava. We moved there in the beginning of March 1927. Snowstorms were still raging over the ice-covered sea. The snowdrifts enveloped our cottage almost up to its eaves, and in the morning we couldn't get out without a shovel. But the cottage was warm, heated by chips of horse dung that we bought from the local people. The chips were easy to ignite and held heat for a long time. After the spring rains, the steppe became more active. The smells of the wormwood and grasses, the blooming poppies and daisies, the sounds of the grasshoppers, and up above, the bell-tone song of the lark. Before you realized it, the steppe grass was up to your knees, and soon even a man on horseback could disappear in it. And look, what flowers! So many birds! All is alive and happy. How gorgeous were the steppes by the beginning of summer! While living in Mankovka, USSR, my husband was the director of the Mankova Kalivinsk Technical School, located not far from the railway station. Someone had informed the authorities during a card game, where tongues tend to wag, that he allegedly said, the Kremlin has become inhabited by little long noses. This was symbolic of certain little insects that live in the Kuban region and exist by eating the kernel of wheat grain. Finally, he had to forfeit his rights and leave this area where we were all living, along with resigning as director of the school. Moreover, he was put under house arrest until further notice. Since there were no guards assigned to watch my husband, he took advantage of the situation by jumping out of the window and escaping. I did, however, manage to find a room. My children and I were invited by another family to live with them until our situation improved. Even though they were very cramped living with their two children in one small room, these kind folks gave up their kitchen and never even asked me to pay for it. Once in a while, I was able to work for a day, hauling bricks to a construction site or cleaning up stores. This was not sufficient work because even a full day's pay was barely enough to buy a little bread, and so we starved. Mommy, did you bring us some bread? No, my children, I couldn't find work today. Well, all right, then bring us some tomorrow. This was how my children often greeted me. With my children, I moved to Mariupol, where my widowed father was living. Mariupol was the main city in our region. The rural council assigned to our office was known as the periphery. All the farmers living on the periphery, whether they owned livestock or not, were expected to contribute a precise amount of meat to the government agency. In addition, the state took their surpluses and levied fines down to the last cow or goat. They were labeled as unwilling and evil tax evaders. The policy of taking the grain and bread from farmers began in the 1920s. When the state later realized that it couldn't do without the farmers, it introduced the new economic policy, NEP. With the arrival of the Stalinist era, however, the state began a policy of extreme and repressive measures with the purpose of organizing the collective farms. Sweeping every last grain from the bins of the peasants, the authorities then sent them away to Siberia and the Solovki Islands. Without considerations to the sick, the aged, or the children, and without even allowing time to say goodbye, the police would arrive and, at gunpoint, force these people into trucks, ignoring the wailing, the crying, and the moans. One evening, I took my place in a line for meat in order to be among the first when they opened at seven in the morning. By nine, I had to be at work. I reserved my space, making sure that all those in front and behind me 
knew who I was, and went home to check up on my ill children. Many women at that time had sick children requiring attention. It was around four in the morning, and going home was chilly and frightening. I hurried along in the center of the street without looking back. Making a turn onto my street, I passed the NKVD headquarters and noticed several heavily loaded trucks heading for the train station. I moved to the sidewalk and walked alongside them, counting eight trucks. By chance, I happened to look into the last truck and collapsed from shock. Underneath the stretched canvas, I saw a pair of human eyes looking at me. My knees began to shake. When I stopped, a thought hit me like a lightning bolt. I could be arrested right here on the spot for witnessing this and never see my children again. Apparently, they were moving inmates from the NKVD basements to the trains. I lagged behind the caravans and, as soon as I turned the corner, ran down the street and directly home. Meanwhile, the amount of arrests increased. Citizens were now taken away by the authorities according to the quotas determined for each region. The food lines, the refugees, mobilization, life became a boiling pot. The newly drafted soldiers marched at a brisk pace down the main street and alongside. Keeping up on the sidewalk were their families, shouting, lamenting, crying. Those departing kept turning around to see, just one more time, the face of a loved one, and bid farewell. They were herded toward the railway station. A neighbor who was a lieutenant came in for a minute to say goodbye. He sat down and began to cry. Here I am going to the front to fight, and all they gave me were 17-year-old boys. They are untrained and never held a rifle in their hands. Now what am I going to do with them? There is no transportation. We have to walk to the Polish border. I was given three rifles. This is not a war. This is murder. Work was stopped at the Azovstal plant after the initial attack. Machines were removed and specialists evacuated. After Azovstal, another even larger plant, the Ilyich, stopped production. Smaller factories and shops also began closing. The result was that in virtually one day, 150,000 people lost their jobs. How were we now going to feed our children, the elderly, and our invalids? Where were we to get money to buy bread? No one had savings. What was bought was eaten. It was then that people had begun to understand the severity of their situation. Panic insidiously crept into our souls. There were some men who had been critically injured and were unable to move. My children and the other women organized a group for the assistance of the injured and went around openly asking people to give what they could. As it turned out, there were thousands of these POWs. When the military front moved deeper into our country, some of them were released and made their way home. Those that live further away join local collective or private farms, which continued to exist under the Germans. Suddenly, the authorities announced that these former prisoners should report for registration. Those that came were placed behind bars, and Mariupol had its first concentration camp. Up to now, the Jews had been left alone and walked about freely, although the authorities were keeping track of them. On a certain day, old man Gorlin, who had been a neighbor, came knocking on my door and informed us that the Germans had ordered the Jews to pack up their belongings and prepare to leave. By evening of the same day, we watched as they were led down the street toward the military barracks outside of the city. By the time we ran outside, the first column had already passed the house. In front were the rabbis, the doctors and their families, and the Jewish intelligentsia. Next were the elderly, supported under the arms. The sick were on stretchers, and the children walked along, carrying knapsacks and small bundles. 
the procession moved very slowly. After the last column passed and the convoy had all but disappeared from view, we saw a young woman running with two children, desperately trying to catch up. She held an infant under one arm. Clutching her other hand was a three-year-old girl dragging a large doll. The guards had apparently forgotten about them. The doll was slowing them down, so the mother grabbed the girl with the doll and placed her on top of a bundle that was tied to her arm. Then she continued running, trying to catch up with her people. It was difficult to believe that they would shoot down seven and a half thousand people for no reason. But several days later, they were executed and buried in those same trenches that we had dug around the city before the Germans arrived. A vile, inhuman, and criminal act had taken place in history. Several people died in our building. The Jews had been killed, and the yard became empty. My children and I were sent to Germany. At the Mariupol station, we said goodbye to everything that had been dear to us, and we said goodbye forever. The railway car was filled to the limit, and the doors were bolted shut with a padlock. One of the men in the prison was a German soldier, a deserter. He had been arrested because he went home to visit his sick wife and children without permission. He told us about the battle at Stalingrad and the German defeat on all of the fronts, the armies destroyed and retreating. He said that half of Germany was already in American hands. We listened in amazement, not believing our ears but saying nothing. We did not want to miss a single word of his account. Throughout our entire four-year imprisonment, we had not known what was happening on the military front. We stood for hours in the hallways with the other prisoners, talking without being told to return to our cells.